Hello. Hello. Well, two years ago, when I did this show, you know, I used to I ask the question of the audience, how do you know when you're getting old? Well, I bloody know now, because it's two years on, and I'm feeling quite old. Lots of things have changed, and you know, this is a very happy day for me, really, because today, I am celebrating with my wife seven years of happy marriage, you know? No, no, no fair play. We've been married 49 years. I reckon that's about one day a week. It, seem, it seems to suit us both, you know. We, we meet on a Wednesday, usually, for a cup of coffee. But <laughs> she's taking over my life. It's a very strange feeling. You know, they... I don't know, you, are there any older ladies in... I can't see any older ladies in the audience, only young ones. But they do. She runs everything, you know, and, and your body sort of changes a bit as you get older. Hair takes over your life. You know, hair that used to grow prolific on the top of your head, it kind of moves around. <laughs> it's out your nose, it's out your ears. I've even got it out my arse. It, it, you just don't know what to comb first, do you? It's just terrible, really. <laughs> But she's very good to me, she's very good, and she organises my life. And to be honest, without her, I don't know where I would be. I would not be the man here tonight if it wasn't for her. Well, this is one way of getting out of the house, isn't it? Um, <laughs> she organises everything, she makes appointments for me, she tells me what to wear each day, she puts my clothes out, and she puts my food out, and uh, she speaks to me at least once a day, and often two times. You know? And she said to me the other day, she said, I've made a doctor's appointment for you for tomorrow morning. I said, well, thank you very much. What time? She said, 10 o'clock. I said, OK. What am I going for? Oh, you'll find out, she said. <laughs> off, off you go. <laughs> so I trotted off down to the doctors. I love a surprise, don't you? <laughs> when I got there, there was nobody in the waiting room, only me. <laughs> he called me in. He said, yes, John, you're here about the vasectomy, I understand. <laughs> am I? <laughs> yes, he said, there's a few questions to begin with. He said, first of all, uh, how is your sex life at the moment? I'm not sure I can remember, to be honest. He said, well, you know, how's things going generally? I said, well, I suppose I'm 73 now, you know. The years are passing me by a bit, really. Well, listen, he said, we're going to check things out a little bit. He said, come behind the screen and drop your kecks. He said, let's have a little look at what you're made of. So he's giving it this, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, what a bloody way to make a living, eh? If you... If all day and every day, all you're doing is weighing up blokes' balls, I mean, it's not a way to make a living, is it, really? Anyway, he said, well, it all seems in good working order. I said, well, I'm the father of five children, and the youngest is 41 now, so, I've, you know, it should be, shouldn't it? It should be working. He said, yes. The only suggestion I can make to you, really, John, he said, the vasectomy is perfect. He said, you can go and have that, no trouble at all. But before you do, he said, I think you should consider the, uh, the sperm bank. I said, the sperm bank? For why? Why do I want to go to a sperm bank? He said, well, make a donation. He said, think of it as backup. Think of it that if all else fails and, you know, you want to father a few more in the future. I said, no. He said, well, anyway, go tomorrow morning. He said, present yourself at the collection point. It's a bit like going, oh, gosh, really? <laughs> he said, you turn up at the collection point and the girl says, well, she showed me into this room that was really lovely. I mean, it was, this is nice, but, you know, this was wonderful. Low lights, warm magazines over the tables, very nice. Pictures around the place. She gave me this little pot, I thought, what's that for? Anyway, I sat there for half an hour, nothing happened. And all of a sudden, this woman dressed as a nurse, I don't she'll never know whether she was a nurse or not. She came in and she said, can I give you a hand, she said. And I said, well, if you like, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, 30 seconds, we had a result. It was wonderful, you know, no problem. To, it's, it's many a long day since this has happened to me, I can tell you. So anyway, <laughs> this thing continued. We got the sperm put away safely. Very nice. Thank you very much. We may use it in the future. Who knows? But then it, the next day was the vasectomy day. Well, has anybody ever had one? Give us a shout if you've had a vasectomy. Yeah. Now you see. Ah, uh, now we're getting down to it, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. We don't. We're blokes, and we don't like to talk about the equipment being messed with, do we? No, no. So I went in, and there's a queue of blokes lined up. And the surgeon comes out, he says, gentlemen, this won't take long. He said, five minutes per man, form a cue. You're coming in, he said, it's ever so simple. One little local anaesthetic and we'll do the business. Oh, hold on, son. Uh, excuse me, local? What's all this local stuff? I'm not doing that. He said, why not? I said, I'm scared. He said, well, there's always one, isn't there? Okay, he said, back, get to the back of the queue, he said, and 
two o'clock this afternoon after I've had my lunch and I've had a, you know, swift half, I'll be with you. <laughs> so two o'clock comes round, I present myself and I told him it was going to be a big job, you know. Well, you do, don't you? You know, you've got to, got to voice it up a bit, haven't you? <laughs> the nurse comes out, leads me into the room, in I go. Aha, I knew I was right. There was four nurses and two surgeons. I told you it was going to be a big job. Off comes the robe. You're stood there in all your glory. There's no good being shy, is it? <laughs> up on the table, right? Out comes the bloke. Got his needle, stuck it in my arm. I've gone. I'm in la-la land. I don't know how much later it was, because you lose track of time when you're under an anaesthetic, don't you? But as I woke up, I thought, this is bloody strange. I, could, I found myself going... <laughs> the bloody hell, they don't know my tongue. What's happened here? Out comes the surgeon. He says, right, he said, do you want the good news or the bad news? Mm -hmm. Give me the good news. He said, the good news is, it's a very successful operation. You will be fathering no more children now, which is 73. You know, I'm quite glad about that, really. I've got out of the habit of it, you know. I said, well, what's the bad news then? He said, well, as we wheeled you out of the theatre, you fell off the trolley, bit your tongue. <laughs> he said, we have to take you back in, 10 stitches. He said, I'll see you in a week. We'll take the stitches out. I thought, well, I don't know. What a way to bloody make a living. But it's, it's an ill wind, isn't it? And... I'm thinking to myself, do you know, in 18 years' time, if there's any children that have benefited from my sperm, they're allowed to find out, aren't they, when they're 18? So I can picture the scene now where the 18-year-old romps up, and I'm there, 91, and they're going, hello, daddy. <laughs> and I'm saying, hello. And they say, are you rich? I say, no, no. I ride a mobility scooter. I live in, I live in sheltered accommodation, and I've given all my money to the local dog's home. So I think that's something to look forward to, you know. But just before I go, let me share one thing with you. you know? I'm doing this this time because I lost a very dear friend to leukaemia last December. So if you would all put your hands together for Alan Bird, I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much.